Hello, and welcome everyone to today's session. We are so delighted to have you here today. Um, a special thank you and welcome to our WBAX joining us in partnership. These are the great women business entrepreneurial cluster across California. We're inspired by the work that you're doing and the businesses that you're building and look forward to having you with us and sharing in the engagement today. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Nicola Korsline and I'm the founding executive director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. The Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potential and grow. We're here for you in support of these times through the good times and through challenges. Now, just so you all know, we are going to be open for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please make sure to submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout this presentation. And of course, none of this would be possible without the amazing support and help that we have from all of our sponsors and contributors. We are truly humbled by their support and their partnership in all that we do. Now, during these unique times, we are uh, polling and asking for engagement uh, from our attendees and our entrepreneurs uh, joining us through these course uh, contents. The first poll that I'd like to launch uh, today is just to find out how are people doing um, in this time. Uh, we've been tracking this honestly uh, over the course of several months and are really trying to understand how our businesses are faring in good times and in bad. Um, and I think uh, obviously, understandably, the pressure has never been greater for our businesses. Um, if you have a chance to respond to this poll that's in front of you, we deeply appreciate it as we go through. The second poll that I'm going to be launching um, and uh, and offering out for feedback and insights is just quickly sentiment uh, grab of what type of entrepreneur you are. Um, are you uh, aspiring? Are you an other entrepreneur? Um, uh, are you currently in business? Um, if you could take a moment to just respond to this poll that is being launched, we'd deeply appreciate it too. And the final poll that I'm going to be launching up here in just a second is really trying to understand what is keeping you up at night right now. We have a number of topics, a number of domains that, again, our business owners are struggling with, ranging from finance to sales to marketing and the likes. Um, if you could take a moment to just kind of share from your perspective what those challenges are that are keeping you up at night, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we look forward to providing you with additional information on those results of the polls as we continue forward. And now without any further delay, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce our amazing guest speaker today, um, Annalisa Taharo. Uh, she is the partner and strategy at KPMG and will be sharing some tremendous insights with us as we go through and try to navigate more smartly and intentionally our financial health during these difficult times. Annalisa, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Annalisa Dahar. I'm a partner within KPMG strategy team. And uh, more importantly to this conversation, I lead our working capital and kind of cash uh, center of excellence within the strategy team. And uh, what uh, we're gonna be presenting some uh, ideas today of things that what we're seeing in the marketplace, not only from a trend perspective, but what our clients have been most uh, focused on in the last few months uh, and really kind of inviting that dialogue. I know we have Q and A at the end, uh, for the team to kind of think through what are some things that you could individually do as you think through your businesses and and where you are within uh, kind of your journey and given our current situation. Isis, can we put up the, the slide? Thank you. Great. So first, I wanted to share with you uh, some, some key thoughts on what we're seeing in, in the place. As you can imagine, it's been very well widespread global pandemic. Uh, quite a few people have uh, been infected. It's impacted from a health perspective and from a growth uh, and kind of economy perspective. I think this where this differs very much from our kind of prior Great Recession is that was more economic driven. Whereas today, what we're seeing is a lot of impacts really driven by 
of health concerns that dictate and, and will impact how we do business, even as we kind of reemerge and open up uh, business and continue to think through that. So how does that impact? Uh, we see market and, and societal impacts. From a market side, you see impacts to the GDP as well as S&P um, history uh, drop and also thinking through what does that do for people's ability uh, to kind of have and maintain jobs. We're seeing a uh, largest job loss in, in history. And, you know, as this kind of goes forward and as we've kind of seen a research in, in July and now we're into August where you know, in many cases, it's still going strong. And in some, some states, it is increasing. Uh, you know, it's going to be a continued concern for many people as they think uh, through various steps. I am a mother as well as a partner within KPMG. And so I'm sure many of you out there can, uh, can, can also commiserate with me. My kids also went back to school this week. So we are doing distance learning. Uh, I'm in California. So it's one of those things where you know, not only do you have the concerns of, of the work, but then you also the concerns of the home and the family uh, that that are weighing on many people's minds as they consider how they think about the next few months uh, through to the new year. Next slide, please. So we have a team that looks at uh, what we call our consumer and retail strategy team. And they have been through the pandemic, they have been looking at and doing pulse surveys amongst consumers to really try and understand what is sentiment, where are people landing? And I just provided a little bit of information from one of those most recent pulse surveys for you here to kind of get the you thinking on what are people, how is it impacting people? And how could it potentially impact your particular, particular businesses? What we're seeing is that right now, uh, overall, we're still down 10% year over year and it's continuing. Uh, we've done this pulse survey for the last three months, um, kind of running, and we'll probably continue on even, you know, even through the rest of the year. But one of the things that we see is, you know, that definitely we're seeing a climb back up, but you know, largely there were some big key dates as you think about when we first had the first case of COVID, when there were a lot of lockdowns, stimulus package, and, and where we are today. When we think about spending and how consumers are spending, they're changing how they're spending and what they're buying uh, in, in these times. And also it has differed by regions. We have a little bit of a heat map here for the U.S., uh, and, and that, you know, if we look globally, I'm sure it looks a little differently as well. But if you can see, you know, and change in consumer spend is anywhere from 8% drop to in the very, very dark blue um, kind of states up to a 20% drop in, um, in that consumer spending. So it is impacting different companies a little bit uh, differently amongst the different um, industries, but it's also impacting different regions. And that's largely also driven by the lockdown access and, and general concern uh, by that um, by the people within that state that based on where they are within uh, kind of the up, rise up of uh, the pandemic issue. Next slide, please. So you know, some of the key themes from our kind of July COVID-19 consumer pulse survey, which we just published, uh, the team just published, is that in reality, we're looking at a long road to recovery and at least from the sentiment of the consumer. So if we think about it, most households have had some impact, about 18% of, of consumers that we uh, interviewed said that their position had been eliminated and 37% had some, some experience of reduction in household income, um, both in the level of optimism and, and kind of thinking about when they'll return back to, to normal strength, uh, trend, spending trends. Uh, yeah, now it's looking like most people are thinking it'll take two years. And that is a, a slight increase from our June poll. I think June poll was slightly more optimistic. Now it's a little bit more reserved uh, as seeming that this is gonna take longer than uh, many people had anticipated at that time. Other you know, regional sentiments, as I mentioned with the spend map is that you know, it does vary. And you know, as you can see the increased pessimism existing in the West and that's also possibly driven by the fact that there were rises in cases in July, uh, heavily impacting the West, and it's kind of going by region. So, you know, month by month, we're still tracking to see what are the sentiment, how are things going, but we are seeing a little bit uh, of, of a downturn from the, from the optimism that we might have seen in June. When we think about kind of the impact of consumer, their mobility, we're seeing, you know, trends and shifting on how people are doing work, how they're buying. So uh, as you can imagine, those businesses that are 
more online or kind of help us work and learn and live in the homes are, are seeing that uptick. Whereas other businesses that, you know, require you to go out into the spaces, you know, or have, are suffering from the current situation. We're also seeing that a growing number of people that are leaving the cities that they live in, and, and this is largely driven by the kind of virtual working, 11% of respondents actually three, three months into this are not living in the city that they started in kind of March timeframe. Uh, another thing to think about is that we saw that 60% of the respondents will continue to work remotely, either full or part-time, and more than 25% of respondents had children uh, that will be doing some some form of virtual learning environment, and I fall in that group, so I can I you know I can feel for all the parents out there that are navigating a kind of um, what the school uh, will have and and the family versus the the work life um, balance. Um, some of the other surprises, uh, kind of from back to school spending, we're seeing large upticks in those school supplies. So obviously, as people are bringing the school into their homes, they're they're wanting to stock up for the school supplies. We're seeing that rise. We're also seeing uh, an increase in computer and hardware that allow people to have a more virtual life, uh, you know, as opposed to clothing, um, kind of as a rise. And then a preview on the holiday spend. Uh, almost 80% of our uh, survey participants said that that they will make purchases around the winter holiday and actually some are even starting to purchase now as early as August. 11% of people are actually starting to think about the holidays. So, you know, we are having still seeing shopping. We're doing more online. We are, um, you know, the only category where we see kind of year, year over year increase in spend is really in that computer and hardware really thinking about the tablets and the way that allow us to work in school from a remote um, kind of way of, of being. Next page. So when we think about kind of at, when we think about our clients and what we've seen in, in the in the last few months, uh, there have been, as you can imagine, a large amount of demand shocks uh, and supply shocks. So demand shocks in the sense of you know, with liquidity being an issue, most companies are hunkering down and really thinking about what do they need to spend, uh, limiting some of their um, their expenditures, only spending what is absolutely critical as they try and make their dollar stretch and think about their liquidity uh, as it's still a bit uncertain as to how, how much longer you'll have impacts to the economy and impacts to specific business lines and revenue. We're seeing supply shocks within uh within uh, the company thinking that, you know, there are in many instances, whether it be you know, early on with some of the uh, kind of import and, and kind of quarantine and re and kind of going through that sort of thing and travel bans that will impact uh, what could come into the U.S., especially for from a global perspective. But then also, even if you think about just general logistics, uh, longer timeline seen to receive inventory and even the social distancing requirements within the, um, within the, the space of, let's say, a manufacturing plant, all impact uh, how our companies are thinking about supplying, how they're, how they're delivering to their customers, and how they're interacting with them. What that has mean is that a lot of companies have been focused on their cash flow and thinking through what is their liquidity situation and, and when and how much do they need to kind of work through and plan from that perspective and really thinking through where should they be targeting to make sure that they have the right level of cash flow to survive through, um, through the current uh, pandemic situation. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so when we think about each, as you individually think through your business lines, you know, one of the things that we see a lot of our clients thinking through is where do they fall on uh, the spectrum of how companies are being hit? We, we saw a number of companies that were the hard reset. Those are your travel and, and leisure industries and, and those things such as hotels, airlines, uh, tour groups. Uh, as you can imagine, they had almost a cessation of business. So they're thinking through when do when does business start up again? What does that look like? What safety requirements are they going to have to put in place? On the flip side, you have the surge, which is uh, those uh, companies that operate in an online presence, or as we mentioned, uh, have the um, kind of electronic base, 
or offer an, a, a way for companies to interact uh, and be more virtual, they're definitely seeing an uptick in businesses now what our needs are changing very rapidly. And then where the vast majority of companies are sitting is really in that transform to reemerge and that modified business as usual, which are they're starting to see slowdown of, of maybe some payments with some of their customers. Maybe they're seeing slowdown, in, uh, slowdown of orders. They're trying to think about how they may have impacts of some of the, the supply or demand uh, kind of things that, that are being noted and trying to think what does that plan look like as they set themselves up uh, to make sure they maintain the right level of, level of, equi of liquidity. Next page, please. So kind of early and, and foremost, what we're seeing is a lot of companies thinking through that uh, and, and really in these kind of five buckets of, of things that, that they have done, even from March early on, some more aggressively than others uh, due to need and, and others kind of as they think through the various evolution of, of their business over the last few months, as it has rapidly changed for a lot of companies. One of the first things that in levers that we've seen a lot of companies pull is active expense management. So a very uh, strong and focused approach of looking at all the spend that's out there and what is necessary versus not necessary. And that can manifest itself into two ways. Not only is it the expenditure, but also going to vendors and working with them, especially for vendors that are non-critical, uh, where you can possibly extend terms. Uh, and kind of work with them on payment plans uh, to kind of give you a little bit more breathing room. What we're also seeing is a lot of companies thinking about their cash forecasting and revenue forecasting. That really goes hand in hand with the last box, which is the scenario planning and management. A lot of companies we see out there are focusing on what is their cash forecast? What amount of cash they need to survive and through what period? Do they need external sources of cash flow and do they have access to them? With the recent uh, CARES Act, PPP loans, a lot of companies have been thinking through what access do they have to from, from a bank or from government uh, additional funding and what can they do from an internal process that can improve that cash forecast. And then just really trying to get a little bit more granular in that look so that you can spot the trends and get ahead of any potential risks or issues. Uh, I'm going to skip over the middle one. I'm going to spend kind of the, I want to end on that one. Uh, but one of the other things that we're seeing a lot of organizations doing is thinking about uh, stabilizing their supply chain. So we've had clients uh, think through if they might have supply issues, possibly even pre-ordering some items or bringing in some of their spend to make sure that they have what they need in order to deliver to their client base. And to do that, to some extent, goes back to the forecasting and really trying to understand what clients are going to buy, at least in the short term, so that you make sure that you can not have any disruption to that. And in some cases, uh, maybe gain some additional effort from uh, kind of from stabilizing that supply chain and having it um, kind of at the ready. The last one I think I'll cover is, is really that customer centricity. So what we're seeing a lot of companies do is really focus on the customer and focus on it from two perspectives, kind of similar to how we look at the vendors and expense management from two perspectives. But one, it's for those existing customers making that have outstanding payments, what can they do to be more aggressive about uh, you know, watching and monitoring that process so that they aren't um, surprised by any kind of liquidity issues on their customer side? What it could mean is everything from making sure that they're more timely, especially if you're talking about a service organization or something where you have a certain delay between the time that a, that a service was rendered to the time that you actually issued the invoice. What can you do to make sure that you have all your decks in a row so that you can bill more timely? And then also uh, thinking about it from really trying to understand and feed into that revenue and cash forecast of what is, the what is the customer looking like and what do they need and how do you pivot to best meet those, those customer needs and how do you partner with especially your key customers so that you can make sure that there aren't any um, disruptions in your process or hiccups uh, that will impact your revenue uh, and, and then ultimately impact your cash flow. Next slide. 
So when KPMG thinks about this and you know, what most companies are kind of focusing on, all of that culminates into what we call the four C's. And it's called the four C's uh, and because it is very valuable and we think cash, cost, customer, and capital. So it's thinking through what is, the, what is available cash and your access to cash. And that could be both from your internal liquidity through to your external funding. What cost do you have and which are the costs that are absolutely necessary? So if you were to boil it down to what are your, uh, your minimal expenses you need to, to manage versus what are the ones that are, um, are kind of can be put on hold even temporarily as you uh, plan for and then develop various scenarios for when we think uh, revenue and business will pick up. And then of course, always, always your customer base thinking through uh, what is your customer looking and pivoting so that you match their needs? Next, next slide. So kind of four steps that we've seen a lot of organizations, as I mentioned, establish visibility. So whether or not you have a cash forecast already, there's no time like the present to really do an accounting of where all the cash you have, what are all your assets and liabilities? What is your minimum expense requirement? And where do you have ability to flex? Where might there be opportunities for you to push a little bit more so that you can always maintain and have visibility to your cash? Uh, we've had instances where we've worked with clients where they, you know, had an, in, uh, you know, we walked in there on a, on a Monday and, and by Tuesday we had identified that they were going to be missing payroll that Friday. Luckily they had access to, uh, to kind of external capital. So that was something that they learned very, very quickly that they need to draw down on that. But without being able to really have visibility to that, you may not know when you need it most or where specifically uh, you might be able to flex that uh, to kind of help your organization. One of the other things that we're seeing a lot of companies doing right now is thinking through all the processes, all the operational and cash management processes that are going to help them stay liquid and make sure that they have, uh, they have the right amount of cash. So whereas it can be getting access to external funds, it can also result in some of the things that we talked about, such as, you know, how are you managing your customer base? Are you billing on time or are, or are there some opportunities for you to bill more quickly? Uh, what, what terms are you offering to your customers? Is there any opportunity there? Uh, are you actively seeking out uh, kind of follow-up and payment? A lot of times we know that customers will have disputes and that could sit out there for a while. So the sooner you identify that there is some kind of a dispute or something that is preventing payment, you can then resolve it and then actually um, kind of get that payment going and, and kind of remove any of the obstacles uh, for payment there. Uh, getting ahead of spending and also thinking not only just getting ahead of how much you're spending, but also thinking about uh, what are the vendor terms that you're getting. We're seeing a lot of companies get anywhere from a two week reprieve on, on kind of due date. So going out to the vendors and saying, hey, I'll pay you, I just need a couple extra weeks to kind of make that, make that payment all the way up to we're seeing some companies going after 90 and 120 days uh, to kind of get through the short-term period. Now this, and then of course the last one is, is tapping the external resource of cash, which, which is one of the, the kind of first things that a lot of companies do too as well. Thank you, Isis, we'll go, we'll go to the next slide. So when we think about creating value through, uh, through working capital or cash management, you know, one of the things that, you know, we open it up for questions, happy to kind of discuss with the team. But the perspective we take is, you know, really there's so many places where cash can get caught up in the business and where you can actually have improvements that can have real short-term impacts and, and really help you kind of move forward, move the needle. And that's everything from, you know, if you think about it, what is the cycle of, of business? It's, you design a product, you make it, you sell it, you get payment for it. Um, when we think about it, all, all along the lines, there's little spots where you could possibly be getting better terms from your vendor or um, kind of having your inventory and making sure that you have the right level of the right inventory so that you're not possibly sitting on a bunch of items that you can't sell and running out of items that you need. So as we think about it, you know, what are all the different steps that you could do uh, as a company to really make sure that you're making your working capital truly work for you?
And here's some examples we think about, you know, it's everything from, from the vendor, do you get terms from your vendor? And if you do, are they in line with what um, kind of others are able to get? Do you make sure that you have received the good and invoice before your payment clock starts? Um, are there kind of opportunities for you to batch your payments and think through when you actually uh, kind of issue the payment and kind of communicate that? There's all kinds of opportunities there. From an inventory perspective, really going back and matching the inventory levels to the demand, factoring in things like lead times and, uh, and other minimum order quantities. We've had many cases where, uh, where clients will have a lot of inventory and you oftentimes will only see it when you run out of inventory, not necessarily when you have a lot, unless it's, it's very much a lot of inventory on hand, but could you be investing your money in different um, kind of items within your inventory that will work for you, that will get you more profitability, that will sell quicker for you, as opposed to items that are going to sit on your shelf a little bit longer. Are there things that you can work with some of your vendors so that they can do drop ships or, um, or provide uh, kind of vendor manage that allow you to be able to um, kind of leverage their capabilities uh, so that you don't have to hold so much of that inventory on, on hand for yourself. And then, of course, there are the contracts you negotiate with your with your customers. Are they overly complex and require, you know, a lot of hoops to jump through in order for you to get payment on authorizations? And are you billing timely and are your invoices correct so that there's no reason for them to kind of dispute payment or delay payment? Uh, do, are you getting customer terms that are in line with you know, kind of what others are getting in, in your field or in your, in your line of business or industry. And, uh, and, and are customers paying timely? I think if we think retail, that's probably the best case scenario where they're paying cash or with credit, but even with some consumer good products, you'll sell into businesses that will have terms. And even if you provide a service, you could have terms on that as well. So are you really thinking through all the steps of the process to make sure that that you know uh, that you know not, it's not only so much as when is the revenue going to come in, but what is the, when is it actually going to turn into cash that you can then fund to grow your business or maintain your business. When we think about one of the things that we talked about was the visibility and and really thinking about how do you get visibility to there's all sorts of, of metrics that companies put in place to watch uh, cash flow and their working capital. Uh, you're thinking through the three big buckets that fall into your cash statement are your AP, your AR, AR and your inventory, really thinking through what's going to drive that improvement. They tend to be the most um, kind of movable and have a lot of operational activities, both process as well as con contractual things that impact how big they are. So when we think about how do we get good visibility, there are some common challenges uh, when optimizing that, but it's something that uh, that you know, most companies are thinking through as they try and figure out you know, where they stand now, as they think through various scenarios of how the uh, how the the downturn or kind of slowly raising of, of uh, kind of business lines will continue. It's always uh, first and foremost the data sets and the data sources. So thinking through what information do you need to track. Uh, for, to get a really good line on what your, um, you know, what your cash flow is going to look like. It's things like your payroll, your taxes, your, your outstanding vendor invoices that you have to pay, your incoming customer receipts, and when you think that's going to come in, how good you are at maintaining that and visibility to that will impact your cash forecast and, and where that number will come out. Uh, thinking through metrics and, and uh, kind of that, accuracy of that forecast. You know, what is the realistic forecast? And, and this is oftentimes where we see many companies thinking through various scenarios and thinking through what will happen if I, um, if my business goes through this certain kind of uptick or downtick and what would happen if my customers or my vendors do X, Y, and Z. As you think through that and, and kind of tracking that and which is the trend will help you kind of gain more visibility to realistic forecasts and realistic cash numbers. What tools do you have uh, that can support, whether it be an Excel or QuickBooks or a, or a kind of larger ERP system? 
you know, you can capture this information and track it and do it frequently. A lot of companies, especially in times of COVID, are moving to a weekly look at cash um, forecasts. We call it 13-week direct forecast is, is what we're seeing a lot of companies do. And it's really so they can have keep their finger on their liquidity and not be surprised at month end or quarter end um, as to where they might have slips or variances they weren't anticipating. With that comes the variance analysis. So, you know, if you're looking at it on a weekly basis, you can be able to see what specific um, areas are, are not happening the way you expected them to happen. So then you can actually go into looking into opportunities to resolve and improve those specific areas to get a better feel for where you have needs of cash and, and where you maybe have some surpluses. And then, of course, there's always making sure that, you know, you have the right people within your organization that are providing input into that process so that when you talk about and you think through your various scenarios, whether it be from a revenue perspective or, uh, or a customer payment perspective, you enable your company um, to have the right voices in the room that will have the, the best information. Next, next slide. And this is really the last slide I'll, I'll kind of go through before I open it up to just general questions. Uh, you know, we think about how you can improve or think through cash flow, liquidity, working capital. And ultimately, it comes down to performance enablers within the company. And, and this is something that all companies can think through, big or small. And really, it comes down to the kind of end-to-end -end process, the organization, who has ownership, and what are the agreements you have between the various steps of the process so that that you aren't running into any kind of um, potential of money being trapped in, in a certain area where let's say you're buying too much of product A when you really need product B, um, things like that. Uh, and then also, again, as I mentioned, we spent a little time talking about cash forecast, but it's also kind of key metrics. What visibility do you have and how do you use that to drive and, and kind of inform your decisions? Uh, the leading companies, the best companies, you know, make sure that they are kind of very data centric and really understanding their numbers, constantly looking at trends, constantly looking at what is their performance so that they can make corrections and, and also can make sure that, that as they think about their strategies and decisions that they're incorporating the, the best and newest knowledge. And that can not only be just your internal, but it's also external. In the beginning, I gave a pulse survey on kind of consumer sentiment, as well as some of the numbers that we're seeing largely in uh, kind of globally uh, within, within kind of how economy is working. And those are some things that you can use as indicators as well. So there's probably some third party um, information that you can use to kind of orient and, and think through what are some of the impacts and concerns that, that you'll need to consider um, as you kind of think through your liquidity. Uh, another area is uh, what controls are in place. So, you know, who has the, the sign off and authorizations for to make certain decisions and, and making sure that there isn't any kind of things like rogue spend or, or things that are occurring that could possibly impact your ability to have good liquidity and have visibility to that liquidity. Um, capabilities and technology, thinking through what are the skill sets of the team. D does a team focus on uh, kind of cash flow? Is this one of their, you know, one of their opportunities? Is there an opportunity to do training, a kind of cash culture training, or, or just in general in these various steps where you think AR, AP, are there certain things where if, if people had a, a certain skill set, uh, they would be more, uh, more keenly aware of some of these opportunities to kind of improve that. And then, of course, always, how, how are your process supported and, and your activities supported by the tools you have? It doesn't always have to be fancy tools, but it does have, do have to be ones that work for you and that you know how to use well, uh, and, and that can help kind of support. So the level of support you have from that technology will, of course, aid in all these things, such as your visibility and your controls. And with that, I, uh, I would like to open it up for discussion. Fantastic. Annalisa, thank you so much. There has been um, just a wealth of knowledge that you've been sharing with us today. I may have a new favorite word, cash culture. I think I'm <laughs> going to have to embrace that one and figure out what our cash culture could be in this time and age. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, we've kind of been collecting and, and, and looking at some. And please, if anyone has any questions, uh, go ahead and either use the Q&A function or feel free to pop it into chat. We're available and, and Annalisa is excited to be able to answer your questions live today. Um, but just to get that dialogue going, Annalisa, 
you gave us some really good insights into, you know, weekly reviews of cash mm -hmm. right now, uh, trying to get some deeper sentiment analysis and understanding where this data is being held, where the trend lines are going. What other maybe top two or three specific tactical things could you think of today to help improve our overall cash culture as all of us have to become closer to understanding cash management in a very volatile environment and make it last as long as possible given the unknowns. Absolutely. So if I think of what are the key things that a lot of companies are thinking through, it's really being hyper-focused on what am I spending on? Do I really need this? I mean, we do this in our own households, right? Do I really need this? Do I need to buy the bulk uh, version of this or can I just buy you know, one or two, I think being hyper-focused on that. So, you know, a lot of companies will have a certain amount of capital um, expense that they'll want to grow the business. I think a lot of companies right now are not so much thinking about growing the business as much, so much as sustaining. I think there's a few that are in the growth um, kind of realm, but really thinking through uh, what is the plan? What is the plan for expense? Do I, do I really need to buy um, these items right now or can I put it off? You know, how critical is it to the continued growth and, and the continued maintenance of, of my business? Uh, that's kind of number one, I think, when you think about it. And then also thinking about, again, going back to, I mentioned it on the customer side, thinking through your customer receipts and, and how that process is working. It's so interesting. We've actually seen a lot of our clients um, actually have improved performance in their, what we call DSO or day sales outstanding uh, during this time. And you say, well, how is that possible? I think everybody's kind of, you know, going cash crunch, you would expect that number to get worse. And in some industries, it is, it is getting worse. But where we're seeing it really be impacted and getting better, actually, the industries where they're most hardest hit. And the reason why is that there's this attention and focus. I think when we are in happier, kind of more healthy times, we are maybe a little bit uh, more reserved in kind of reaching out and following up on open invoices, or the timeliness of invoices, especially in service organizations, there's so many times when I have clients that are service organizations that, that um, you know, they can have up to 45 days or 15 or 20 days delay from the time they did the work to the time they issued the invoice. Well, if you think about it, if you're giving someone, let's say a month's pay you or 30 day terms and you, and you don't issue the invoice till a month later, you've now given them 60 days. Now in that 60 days, you now have to float yourself for 60 days until you get that payment. So then it becomes this guessing game, not only of the, the terms and when are they going to pay, but it's also becomes a guessing game of, well, when am I going to get the invoice out that it's going to have the right information that they're going to approve and, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing a lot of companies spending a lot more time and rigor around getting that invoice right and getting it out as quickly as possible, especially in service um, organizations, because that starts the clock. Nobody's going to pay an invoice until they receive it. So if you, even though you've done the work, if you haven't sent an invoice, they will not pay you. So getting that done and more timely, we're seeing a lot of companies focusing on that right now. We're also seeing a lot of companies engage with their customers to really understand what they need. And by doing that, that helps them twofold. One, it and kind of builds a relationship and builds that, you know, we're in this together, we'll, we'll work together to come to a solution. You can set up payment plans in some cases or reinforce uh, when there's issues that, you're, that you'll get them resolved quickly so that they will pay. Um, but then what it also does is it gives you really great insight. And when you think about how, what inventory should you buy, what's going to grow, what are people going to care about, that you buy the right things that people are going to actually buy. Uh, the, la the worst thing possible is to put all your money in inventory that's going to sit there and not have enough money left over to, to restock your shelves with the things that actually are going to drive uh, kind of drive your spend and drive the revenue into, into your business. So really thinking through what are we seeing, what are customers telling us, what are the trends now, and, and looking at hyper focus on let's say the last three to six months and versus you know same time last year versus in the last twelve months, that gives you great indication as to where the trends are, where we are sitting right now. I think it was a little bit crazy, um, you know, sleepless nights for many people, and I know for me too, uh, in March, right? Because March, it was uh, just this huge swath of things happening and concerns, uh, businesses um, kind of shutting down, and you didn't know where it was going to go. We're now sitting here in August, so we have the benefit of March end, 
you know, we have April, June, July. So we have four months of kind of trends. And we also have a lot of companies out there like ours doing these kind of sentiments and surveys. So you can kind of start to build different scenarios and think through what's going to happen. And if you track it on kind of that weekly basis, you can get ahead of it. Uh, and if you actually are very active on, let's say, your inventory and think and seeing what trend, what items do I see flying off the shelves and what items do I see kind of sitting there and starting to grow in there, if we think about days of coverage, right, or coverage, uh, you know, if I have an item that I haven't really sold very many of them in the last six months, you know, but I see this other item that is moving very, very quickly, if I hyper-focus on those and kind of and put my resources towards those, then that kind of puts me in, in a better place to kind of match the demand. So we're seeing a lot of that and kind of companies really pivoting and thinking through what should they be focusing on? Um, where should they put their dollar? Think about it as an affordability, right? You have a, we all have paycheck. We can only afford so much of X, Y, and Z. If I only had X amount of dollars to buy something, where am I going to put it that it's going to work the best for me? And that is why it's called working capital, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's the stuff that you put invest in your business so it works for you, so you can grow and you can grow profitability and you can get the most out of your business. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I and and I think even your insights into gaining greater optionality for businesses in times of uncertainty for sure seem to to be holding true. We've been um, asking our uh, attendees of our programs for the last couple of months their considerations as to when their revenue levels may return to pre-COVID levels. Um, right now, it seems to be the sentiment in general of the community we're serving is about Q2 of next year. Um, picking up some questions questions that have been coming in from the audience around, you know, people like Steve Blank and John Chambers that have been asserting, look, prepare for a long, cold winter, six yeah. months, 12 months. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? Um, yeah. and it's a lovely luxury if you're a business that has got 12 months of cash <laughs> kind of ready right. to sort of store for this long winter. But I think it does still beget a little bit of, um, challenge for many of our businesses who are fighting hand over fist for survivability in this time and pivoting from one model to another. Um, so I guess to come off the soapbox for a moment and use your expertise and guidance, Annalisa, given that you've seen a lot of these businesses work through these mm -hmm. transitions and trying to find their future model for sustainability, how can people think a little differently around all alleviating some of those cash pressures and worries of future state and really maybe looking, you mentioned the 13 week cash scenario. Are there mm -hmm. other strategies that can help guide on new business models that are being injected by our businesses as they figure out their survivability in this moment? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think each business is gonna be a little different and how you can pivot, but we are seeing lots of organizations pivot, thinking about not only how they deal with their customers and moving more to this virtual online, you know, where, where could they do that very well? And a lot of companies were not well equipped for it, right? They were really great for the brick and mortar store and they had an online presence, but the long, online presence was meant to just have an online presence, not necessarily to do e-commerce through, right? So things like that, 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 that companies are now starting to think, okay, this may be the new way and because it is the longer haul, we want to invest in this because this is how we're going to kind of continue to grow and and kind of sh uh, shoulder the load here. Um, but what we what I think is is kind of interesting is is that we're seeing a lot of organizations thinking through, as you said, the 13 week uh, and what is that trending hand in hand with various different business scenarios. And the business scenarios are everything from uh, you know, I, when do we think business is going to pick up or how do we think our customers going to continue? Do I think I'm going to have impacts for my supply because I get all my supply from X um, yeah. country person, whatever. And so, you know, those are the various scenarios and they are a little bit different by each, uh, by each uh, specific company or industry, but really thinking through hand in hand, I want to be able to sit now and figure out, do I have an issue and it doesn't have to be 13 weeks is kind of a minimum, but you can actually push it, uh, you know, far out. And, and most of our clients will say, I have cash to last me through X, right? And in some cases, it's two years and you're saying, great, or I got a cash infusion because I drew down on some credit lines. And I think based on my business expenses, on my expenses per week or X, per month or Y, I can survive until this with a certain perspective of, you know, amount of revenue, right? So there's lots of companies that are thinking through that. And 
because if you do that, you can actually see, is this a short-term issue? Is it a long-term issue? Do I have time to course correct? So the company that says, I have, I have enough, and, and I had one, one client where we were working with them, they're looking at various uh, modeling. It was in one of the hardest hit industries. And when they were looking at amongst everything, they said, okay, we have cash to last us through September, right? And the question becomes, will we think September will, uh, you know, will things pick up? And then you can start thinking through, well, what are some other options I have? Are there, uh, are there things that I can go through, expenses I can cut out? Um, and it's real hand in hand. So I think a lot of companies will think of, you know, the cash forecast as uh, a kind of knock-on effect of the revenue forecast, which, which it is. But what a lot of companies right now are doing is they're taking that cash forecast and using it in the variance analysis to drive specific actions within the organization. So they see, okay, it looks like I'm going to have an issue with cash in a month or two weeks even, you know, how much do I need to sustain myself? And what, what level of revenue do I need to have in order to sustain myself? What levers can I pull um, you know, where do I think, where do I think I have the best opportunity to kind of make the, make the moves that are going to help me survive for the long haul? Cause you're right. We said it in the, in the sentiment is that we're looking at, you know, most forward thinking about, you know, when, when are people going to get, go back to business as usual? And that's going to be a while business as usual, most we're thinking two years. And if you look at, we, we did a look at kind of how far for the latest, um, Kind of issues of recession and various recessions and they vary in time for companies to come back i think you know and anywhere from like a year and a half to sometimes four and five years and i think the sentiment here is well, we don't quite yet know but it is going to be longer right it's not gonna you know hockey stick back up at least uh at least for a while and it's gonna be heavily driven by how people feel because this is not just an economy thing it is how people feel safe and they feel safe to go back out into the workforce or out into the consumer space uh, in the way that they did before. So, you know, thinking through that, how does that really impact uh, the economy and how does that impact how people feel about and, and what they're going to buy and what, when they're going to buy? As you can imagine, clothing not being, you know, key, but yet uh, consumer and electronics. Well, of course, because we're all on tablets or, or laptops, even for our kids, you know, um, as opposed to well, since we're at home, you know, uh, finding, you know, clothing out is, is maybe not as much of a concern as now everybody's into leisure wear, right? So things like that. Okay. But, you know, uh, it, it really is going to impact how, how we think going forward and, and various scenarios. But it's also something that most people are starting to watch the kind of micro trends because the micro trends can spot uh, different areas where you can find opportunities, right? And, and kind of leverage those opportunities going forward. Yeah, that's a good, great insights. You know, picking up on a, a couple of those things uh, really quickly, one on sort of vendor management and the psychology of vendor management a little bit, and the other on sort of uh, pulling down additional capital if that is an opportunity for businesses. Mm -hmm. Certainly on the venture side, we've been listening and watching and seeing challenging trends perhaps around the terms being associated with down rounds or alternative rounds of financing. I guess the question would be on lines of credit, debt financing, uh, factoring to the extent that you guys are seeing any analysis yet? Are terms changing? Is it becoming harder and more onerous to qualify? Is the time to qualify extending itself at all? Any insights that you can provide on gaining that kind of capital infusion and injection to extend the runway, so to speak? Yeah, I think, you know, through CARES Act, BP, there was a lot of opportunities. As, as many know that a lot of those have expired or they've been taken up very, very quickly. I remember I was actually doing another talk like this and we had to postpone it because PPP had run out within like two days of, of it being out there and then they infused it with, with additional funds. Plus um, external kind of bank funding is out there, but it's limited, right? So you have to have the best case and you have to have to go out after it very, very quickly. And I think a lot of companies are kind of past that point of already thinking through drawing down on their lines of credit, uh, getting access to those funds. You know, where we sit now, it is really thinking about kind of alternative programs. Um, in some cases, uh, companies are thinking through debt restructuring or other 
a kind of more drastic measures to help them survive through this. Yeah. And that kind of gets to the other question that I was going to ask on vendor management. I know certain industries, and it's it's been sort of whispered about even in my local community right now, that understandably a lot of them got rent abatement for many months because mm -hmm. of the scenario of shelter in place. Yeah. And unfortunately, as to be expected, those landlords are now looking at a scenario where they too can no longer kind of float back cash uh, outlay anymore yeah. or, or not getting that kind of so the, the pressure from vendor management is really starting to come back in and in many instances mm -hmm. they're starting to say we need it paid in full to the extent that you can share any insights or guidance on you know payment terms negotiations in these times on vendor yeah. side especially ones that have been kind and generous up until this point anything yeah. that you're seeing that's um hopeful and optimistic for our business is struggling and trying to do right but only having so much cash that can go so far right now yeah absolutely so you're right we said we saw that both from a personal from mortgage and and kind of rent holds uh through to in a lot of corporate almost so many of our clients uh, kind of early on in the April timeframe were saying that they were getting and working with their landlords to have a temporary hold on their leases and, and from that perspective. So even corporates, large corporates were getting the benefit of some of these kind of um, leniencies on some of these kind of store locations. And there were a lot of things that I think you saw probably in the press where large organizations were working with their land landowners for some kind of, uh, you know, a, a, kind of will say um, interesting or alternative kind of proposal of if you give us this much time, we'll also we'll pay you back or we'll give you a percentage of X, Y, and Z to try and think through how can we survive and still not possibly lose our physical space. Um, we're also thinking actually we're seeing a lot of is people really rethinking their physical space Full stop. So not only are we seeing that, you know, they were getting a lot of um, kind of help from from landlords, but we're also seeing a lot of companies rethinking, do I really need um, this location or can I consolidate it into this other location? Um, do I really need to be in this market? Am I really getting the profitability I would expect out of this market? Uh, and kind of really thinking the, and that's really, especially if you think about from a consumer and retail, the store locations, how profitable are the store locations? Do I really need to have businesses in, in five cities or or is one or two cities and, and moving towards a more virtual kind of mindset, you know, going to be the long-term view of the way this world is going to look when we're kind of out on the other side of this. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, what we do see from a vendor management perspective is there is a lot of going after kind of elongating vendor terms. As I mentioned, I think a little earlier, we're seeing everything from kind of temporary, hey, can you help us out with a couple of weeks reprieve? We've seen that all the way through to I'm going after I need to move you to 90 to 120 days uh, because I need more breathing room. And for the most part, uh, they're getting, you know, some some element. They won't maybe get a hundred percent of their vendors that say yes, but they'll definitely get quite a few vendors that will kind of work with them. And then also the other thing we're seeing going hand in hand with the vendor terms is requests for discounts. So what they'll say is, hey, I really need you to rethink this contract. We need a discount. Can we think about how we either rescope it? How we either um, kind of rethink the length of time in which I have to pay um, pay for this or um, kind of push some of it into next year. You know, that's, we're seeing a lot of that as well. So not only are they trying to get longer terms and a better way, uh, kind of runway for them to pay, but also again, going back to the expense, do I really need to pay for this now? Is there a spread this over a long period of time from a purchase perspective or get some kind of a discount, um, you know, for, for me to kind of continue moving forward. So we're seeing a lot of that as well. I love that. I'd love to spend our last few minutes um, maybe shifting gears a little bit back to that culture statement and realizing that culture is born from great talent, great talent and great people surrounding our businesses and trying to do right by our talent in difficult times. Now more than ever, realizing that most of the talent rely to a certain degree on either profit sharing or commissions or future earning potential and just wanting to lean in a little bit to that psychological um transparency that is it feels like owed in this moment more than ever before what guidance are you seeing being offered to leaders as they think about how to be creative in retaining talent when juxtaposed with limited cash flow are there any 
creative solves that you've been seeing with how people are really trying to keep their talent energized and motivated, knowing that cash may not be the answer for a little bit of time? Yeah, I think, and this is the hard one, right? Because I think when you get into, sometimes into survivor mode, it, it can be, people are motivated by different things, right? Um, you have a swath of people who are happy to have work and they see that as like, Oof, I, have, I have a job and you're happy to have a job and, and being able to work remotely, that's a real benefit to me. And then you have other people who are just oriented differently um, than that. So how do you motivate uh, that? A lot of it is in kind of shared wins and how you celebrate. It doesn't have to. We used to do this all the time when we would have teams. We would say, you don't always have to give them money. Sometimes it's a celebration and recognition. It's, a, it's some kind of a, you think of a virtual happy hours and things like that to keep people engaged. Um, give, give um, if, if someone's doing something internal that is a particular focus that's going to help you grow or, or let's say you may have a little bit of slowdown in business. So you do some internal training, right? And you recognize the people who are helped to build the, and grow the, the company for the future. I think that gives people a lot of recognition when they feel like they're a part of it, but they're not watching something happen to them, but they're actually a part of making the change and, and proving and, and just also a lot of times what, what I think a lot of companies, a lot of people are feeling is, you know, they're in their homes, they are working virtually. Um, it is hard to have that connection with people in the same way, although we're getting very good at doing virtual and being on screen. Uh, but there's still a little bit of, of that where you may have, you know, people needing to kind of have an outreach and, and have the ability to kind of have that interaction, that human interaction. So any ways that you can do that, whether that be coffee chats or firesides where you kind of highlight the, you know, top five, 10 things that happened that were good and, you know, who drove those. It motivates people to be on that list. And it also motivates people to kind of be connected to their community. Amazing. Well, Annalisa, we can't thank you enough for um, your time, your commitment to supporting businesses in this moment. Um, we're going to be able to share your slides. Thank you for allowing us to do that. Um, and would love to definitely stay in touch and, and reach back out as things go forward. Um, for those of you seeing right now, we have popped a link into the chat box uh, that would ask you to take a moment or two to complete the survey assessment of how we did today and also again continue to give us feedback and insights on what more you're worried about in this time. We know you've got so much pressure writing and we're here in support of all that you're doing for all of our communities and for this nation at large. Um, we do have some upcoming events that we would love to keep you posted on. Um, you can find all of them through our different uh, social channels and also a post Posted on our website. The one coming up this week is a learn-in on widening your circle of care uh, with an amazing coach that we've had in the center's support system for a while, Jamie Greenwood. If you haven't had a chance to hear Jamie talk about how as leaders you need to support yourself first before you can support others, really important topic to double down on and, and find your nourishment in this time too. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you soon. And Annalisa, thanks so much for all you're doing for entrepreneurs. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.